from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Welcome again to the Poetry Pavilion here at the 8th Annual National Book Festival. It's uh, tr truly wonderful to see people gathered here together, united in their love of not just of reading, but of that special kind of reading that's involved with poetry. Now, before I introduce the Library of Congress's new Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry, Kay Ryan, and her interviewer, National Endowment for the Arts Chairman Dana Joya, I'd like to take just a moment to sincerely thank the endowment for sponsoring this pavilion and to thank most specifically its energetic and much admired chairman, Dana Joya himself, for all his work leading that fine organization. He is himself a poet. He will be stepping down in January to devote more time to his poetry. And in this particular festival, celebrating reading, we in America especially thank Dana Joya for the endowment studies that showed how jeopardized serious reading is in these days and in launching important activities in many localities to promote such reading. And we're also grateful for the NEA's sponsorship of this poetry pavilion at the National Book Festival since 2003. This is a relationship we hope to continue in the coming years. So I, I want to just ask a special round of applause for Dana Joya before we begin. <laughs> now in exercising the statutory responsibility I have for making this annual appointment, I've been continuously and increasingly impressed with the richness and variety of American poetry today. That, that's like the richness and variety of America itself, these poetic voices we have. It's well illustrated in the list of distinguished poets that have received this congressionally uh, created t title of laureate, uh, including people like Charles Simic, Donald Hall, Ted Kuser, Louise Gluck, Billy Collins, Stanley Kunitz, Robert Pinsky, Robert Haas, Rita Dove, Howard Nemiroff, Richard Wilbur, and others. It's a wonderful roster of the variety and ingenuity and creativity of the poetic form in our nation. Most of them have also found ways to broaden the reach of poetry into new corners of our national life and new audiences. Now in July, I named Kay Ryan as the 16th poet to be designated as laureate for 2008 to 2009. Kay Ryan's poems re-examine the beauty of everyday places and dig gently into the cracks in our common humanity and our human, common human experience. Her poetry is full of what's rightfully been called sly wit. Uh, it is wonderful and full of surprises as well, unusual rhyme, rhythm, and underlying wisdom. She's been likened to Emily Dickinson, but she is like Dickinson herself and most of our best poets, a one-of-a-kind American original. For more than 30 years, she has taught remedial English at the College of Marin in Kentfield, California. She's written six books of poetry, has been awarded the Ruth Lilly Prize from the Poetry Foundation, Guggenheim National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, uh, Morris English Poetry Award, Union League Poetry Prize, Ingram Merrill Foundation Award, four pushcart prizes. I'm not sure I know what that is, but. Uh, it's, uh, I, like the, I like the sound of it. That's also original. Uh, she's also been selected in four different years for the annual volumes of Best American Poetry. And since 2006, she's been a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome a wonderful poetic voice, the new Poet Laureate of the United States, Kay Ryan, a Dana Joy. Afternoon. By careful planning or simply sheer good luck, you have found yourself in the Poetry Pavilion at the 8th National uh, uh, Book Festival. It is my pleasure to offer you a two-part presentation of Kay Ryan. First, uh, you know, Kay Ryan will read her poems, then she and I will have a conversation, uh, and then if we have some time at the end of the conversation, we might even be able to take a question or two 
from the audience. Uh, Dr. Jim Billington has so well introduced Kay that I won't say much else except to say that I find Kay Ryan one of the most remarkable poets writing in English. Uh, she is an entire original. Her poems are enormously compressed. Uh, you can always follow them on the surface, but there's always something extraordinarily interesting going on uh, at the same time. She uses rhyme uh, as a basic device in her poetry, but almost never the way we're used to hearing rhyme, at the ends of lines. It's the insides of the poem that begin to rhyme. And what the poems uh, combine, to paraphrase Robert Frost, is she leads us through delight to wisdom. Sometimes it is uh, happy wisdom, sometimes it is bitter wisdom. But these are poems that strike me very much in the kind of the great American tradition of the metaphysical, to talk about the surface of reality, the surface of language, the surface of life, but at the same time to unfold the mysteries, the secrets of being, those things which are behind, above, uh, uh, and around reality. Uh, so without further ado, let me introduce you to the new U.S. Poet Laureate, one of America's finest writers, and a sheer delight. From Fairfax, California, Kay Ryan. Thank you, Dr. Billington. Thank you, Dana Joya. I just hate really great introductions like that because they always make me feel really unequal to them. Uh, nonetheless, I will do my best. Uh, uh, I, I sort of feel that I ought to go back and write a whole different body of work that is more suitable for my newly exalted condition, but I'm going to have to work with what I've already written. And I thought I would offer you um, a little retrospective uh, and, and, and start with an uh, older work and move to some newer work. Uh, this first poem thoroughly demonstrates uh, Dana Joy's uh, uh, description of my work as compressed. This is called Emptiness, and I'm always advocating for less and, and emptiness and nothingness and a reduced sensation. Uh, and this poem is called Emptiness. I, I would, I'd like to be the sheriff of emptiness. Uh, I, I come from the West and the Mojave Desert of California. And maybe that's a part of what makes me feel very protective about vacant spaces, both outside and inside. So here's a short poem on that. Emptiness. Emptiness cannot be compressed nor can it fight abuse, nor is there an endless west hosting elk, antelope, and the tough cayuse. This is true also of the mind. It can get used. I, I'll gloss that and tell you that a cayuse is a little Indian horse, if you don't know who the tough cayuse is. Uh, In these busy times, perhaps some of you seek relief. I, even in quiet times, I seek relief. Uh, hence this uh, small vacation poem that, that I've written. Uh, I always think it might be kind of relaxing to, the, to the, uh, the overworked to consider such a vacation, and maybe the over-socialized vacation. It would be pleasant to walk in Stonehenge or other places that have rocks arranged on the basis of a plan or plans inscrutable to modern man. To wander among grinders sunk deep in sheep pastures or simply set on top Peruvian grit. To gaze up at incisors no conceivable jaw could fit to stretch to be ignorant enough, scoured to a clean vessel, as pure as the puzzle, 
a mystery involved, vestal, vestal to a mystery involving people, but without the heat of people. I am a, a big fancier of murder mysteries. I don't really read them for the plot because I have very bad memory and by the time I get to the end I sort of forget how they started and I, there's, there's very little chance that I'll figure out who done it. But I like the details, you know, I like that th when the detective goes in and, and goes through everybody's drawers, you know, uh, looks under the bed. I like, I like all the, the facts and the, the poking about of, of mysteries. And I also like their, their uh, uh, predictability of another attractive thing. So anyhow, this poem has an epigraph from a murder mystery, and that murder mystery was Death is No Sportsman by Cyril Hare. You can tell it was a British murder mystery. And, and here, it, here is the epigraph that just delighted me. Your husband is very lucky, observed Smithers, to have ornithology to fall back upon when fishing fails. <laughs> and to me, that's the ideal life, to consider, consider falling back upon ornithology when fishing fails. So this poem is, is a celebration of, of, uh, of mildness. When fishing fails, when no bait avails, and nothing speaks in liquid hints of where the fishes went for weeks, and dimpled ponds and silver creeks go flat and tarnish. It's nice if you can finish up your sandwich, pack your thermos, and ford this small hi hiatus toward a second mild and absorbing purpose. Uh, here is a contemplation of force, something we generally say, don't force it. Uh, uh, and we think that, that that which is forced doesn't work. And I tend to think that too. Uh, but this, this poem questions, why, well, why not force? Nothing forced works. The Gordian knot just worsens if it's jerked at by a person. One of the main stations of the cross is patience. Another, of course, is impatience. There is such a thing as too much tolerance for unpleasant situations. A time when the gentle teasing out of threads ceases to be pleasing to a woman born for conquest. Instead, she must assault the knot or Alp or Everest with something sharp and take upon herself the moral warp of sudden progress. Uh, I, there was a very long period during which I couldn't get life to go my way hardly at all. A really long time. A period of great frustration during which I felt something like the turtle that you, that you meet in this poem. This poem is just packed with rhyme and imagery. Uh, it's a, k kind of tormented in a way and I think that that comes from it, it having embodied so much frustration. Turtle, who would be a turtle who could help it? A barely mobile hard roll, a four-oared helmet. She can ill afford the chances she must take in rowing toward the grasses that she eats. Her track is graceless like dragging a packing case places, and almost any slope defeats her modest hopes. Even being practical, she's often stuck up to the axle on her way to something edible. With everything optimal, she skirts the ditch which would convert her shell into a serving dish. She lives below luck level, never imagining some lottery will change her load of pottery to wings. Her only levity is patience, the sport of truly chastened things. Uh, one of the things that, that is uh, 
vexing about life is that when things combine, they become heavy. So this is a little poem protesting against combination. Some, a, a, a topic which you may never have heard protested against before. Uh, and it uses do as its, as its medium. Do. As neatly as peas in their green canoe, as discreetly as beads strung in a row, sit drops of dew along a blade of grass. But unattached and subject to their weight, they slip if they accumulate. Down the green tongue, out of the morning sun, into the general damp, they're gone. This poem is called Bestiary, and I, at, at one point I would have thought it was bestiary until I noticed that the word is actually, even though it is a, 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 an encyclopedia of animals, both real and fanciful or mythical, uh, it is spelled bestiary. And I had a beautiful one uh, illustrated by Alexander Calder and, uh, and assembled by Richard Wilbur. And I, I, noticed, I noticed that spelling, and it made me think about what, best, what a bestiary would be. So here's a little, a little description of a bestiary. A bestiary catalogs bests. The mediocres, both higher and lower, are suppressed in favor of the singularly savage or clever, the spectacularly pinchered, the archest of the arch deceivers who press their advantage without quarter, even after they've won, as of course they would. Best is not to be confused with good, a different creature altogether, and treated of in the goodiary, a text, alas, lost now for centuries. Now I'm going to read this poem as sort of maybe a, a, a little uh, s sermon to myself. It's called New Clothes. And of course, being the, the new laureate has, has, has given me new clothes. Uh, and you'll see what happens to new clothes in here. We know about the emperor's new clothes, and that's what this poem refers to. We can sometimes think we're dressed when we're actually naked. Uh, the emperor who was tricked by the tailors is familiar to you. But tailors keep on changing what they do to make money. Tailor means to make something fit somebody. Be guaranteed they will discover your pride. You will cast aside something you cherish when the tailors whisper, only you could wear this. It is almost never clothes such as the emperor bought, but it is always something close to something you've got. Oh, now I'm going to read a poem for Dr. Billington, who mentioned it to me today. Uh, and this is called, A Plain Ordinary Steel Needle Can Float on Pure Water. And, uh, I will reveal to you that I, for many years, used Ripley's Believe It or Not volumes as a source of inspiration. I would just open them up at random and read some strange uh, uh, fact or fancy of Ripley's and, and write about it. And in this case, it's true that some of you may have done this as children, or some of the more enlightened adults may have done it, where you can actually drop a, a, a needle onto the top of a glass of water and it will, it will float there. Uh, it's great, very satisfying. This poem has been read, I can tell you, and I was just shocked to find it out, at a variety of weddings. So just while you're hearing it, think about that. Okay. Uh, a plain ordinary steel needle can float on pure water. Who hasn't seen a plain, ordinary steel needle float serene on water as if lying on a pillow. 
the water cuddles up like jello. It's a treat to see water so rubbery, a needle so peaceful, the point encased in the tenderest dimple. It seems so simple when things or people have modified each other's qualities somewhat. We almost forget the oddity of that. Uh, I, I applaud the most outlandish claims for the power of poetry, uh, and therefore my, uh, my boon companion is Joseph Brodsky, than whom no one made greater claims for poetry. Uh, was that grammatical? Well, you know what I meant. Uh, this is called Composition. Joseph Brodsky, the great, the great Russian poet and, and Nobel winner, was he a laureate? <laughs> and poet laureate uh, uh, said of, of poetry, he said, or of language. He said, language is a diluted aspect of matter. Isn't that gorgeous? Language is a diluted aspect of matter. So I've gone him one better. Composition. Oh, I want to tell you before, I use the word or and argent in this. And in heraldry, or is the word for gold, argent is the word for silver. So, so Brodsky said, language is a diluted aspect of matter. I say, no, not diluted, flaked, wafered, but not watered. Language is matter leafing like a book with the good taste of rust and exposure, the way ironwork petals near the coast. But so many more colors than rust or argent, Others, a vast heraldic shield of beautiful readable fragments revealed as earth delaminates. How the metals scatter, how matter turns animate. Okay. This poem is called uh, uh, patience and it was used in the boondocks cartoon to my absolute and utter delight. After getting in the New Yorker, the best thing that ever happened was getting in the funny papers. And so Riley, these are two little kids and Riley's the, the little revolutionary, or no, Huey's the little revolutionary and, and, and he quotes my poem to Riley. He says, the, the poet Kay Ryan once said, this made me sound really dead but I was happy about it <laughs> anyhow. Uh, and then he quoted like half of my poem, my poems are so short, short that half of my poem showed up in Boondocks. And, uh, and uh, Riley, who's his little thug baby brother, uh, uh, is not at all impressed with my poem. He, he wants a gold chain now, you know. Uh, so this is about patience and about, the, the conceit is that patience is a place. Patience is wider than one once envisioned with ribbons of rivers and distant ranges, and tasks undertaken and finished with modest relish by natives in their native dress. Who would have thought it possible that waiting is sustainable, a place with its own harvests, or that in time's fullness, the diamonds of patience couldn't be distinguished from the genuine in brilliance or hardness? I think it was the diamond reference in there that got, got, uh, got Huey interested in the poem. Uh, this poem is called The Fabric of Life. And I've discovered, you know, we talk about the fabric of life, and I've discovered that we mostly learn about the fabric of life when it is rent, you know, when a rip appears in it. And this is a poem that followed the, the suicide of a very dear friend of mine, and I had no idea how far the repercussions would spread from his death, what, what kind of rip to the fabric a, a death really meant. The fabric of life. It is very stretchy, 
We know that, even if many details remain sketchy. It is complexly woven. That much, too, has pretty well been proven. We are loath to continue our lessons, which consist of slaps as sharp and dispersed as bee stings when any, when, when, from a smashed nest when any strand snaps. Hurts working far past the locus of rupture, attacking threads far beyond anything we would have said connects. Oh, now here's one I have to read because this comments directly upon my current condition, my elevation. Uh, this is called Matra Gupta, and it's another one inspired by Ripley's Believe It or Not. Listen to this epigraph. Matra Gupta of Ujjain, India, wrote a poem that so pleased Raja Vikrama Ditya, he was given the entire state of Kashmir. The poet ruled Kashmir for five years, 118 to 123, and then abdicated to become a recluse. <laughs> what a Trojan horse, thought Matra Gupta. By the way, I have no trouble with that achronological uh, problem there. What a Trojan horse, thought Matra Gupta, rewarded for his verse by Raja Ditya with one of the nicest states in India. Why couldn't it have been a gold watch or an inscribed plate? I'll never write again at this rate. I am too blessed, went the little thank you poem he had rehearsed. But already his words were getting reversed, and he said, I am blue tressed, which was only the first indication of how things were in Kashmir before his abdication. Uh, you know, I'm going to read you one that I thought I'd skip, but I'm not going to skip it. This is a little poem about one of our verbs. Uh, it's called Among English Verbs. Among English verbs, to die is oddest in its eagerness to be dead, immodest in its haste to be told, a verb alchemical in the head, one speck of its gold and a whole life's lead. Naturally, you have the disadvantage of hearing this rather than reading it, my preferred method of poetry transmission. So you don't know if I spelled that L-E-D, meaning gone, done, or L-E-A-D, meaning some, something bad produced by the alchemical process that turned gold to lead. I'll read it again. It's actually spelled at, at, at the metal, but I, of course, want you to think the other way. I'll read it again. Among English verbs, to die is oddest in its eagerness to be dead immodest in its haste to be told, a verb alchemical in the head, one speck of its gold, and a whole life's lead. Here's a poem which uh, I, uh, I later realized is talking about neuroplasticity a real $10 word that means that your, brains, your brain cells can change their functions and do something else if they have to. Uh, but I, wasn't, I didn't even know that word when I wrote this, but it does go on in this poem. And it's called Why We, Why we Must Struggle, and this is not ironic. This is, this is the, best, the best as I understand. If we have not struggled as hard as we can at our strongest, how will we sense the shape of our losses, or know what sustains us longest, or name what change costs us, saying how strange it is that one sector of the self can step in for another in trouble, how loss activates a latent double, how we can feed as upon nectar 
upon need. This is uh, a little, uh, this poem called Weak Forces. And uh, weak forces are one of the forces in particle physics, one of the four fundamental uh, interactions of nature. I like to use things that I take from, I'm sort of a you know, cowbird or a bowerbird or something. I like to borrow uh, the gravity of, of science uh, and hope that it lends weight to my flimsy devices. Uh, so I'm thinking about weak forces here. I enjoy an accumulating faith in weak forces. A weak faith, of course, easily shaken, but also easily regained in what starts to drift. All the slow untrainings of the mind, the sift left of resolve sustained too long, the strange internal shift by which there's no knowing if this is the road taken or untaken. There are soft affinities, possibly electrical, lint-like conjuries, moonlit hints, asymmetrical pink glowy spots that are not the defeat of something, I, I don't think. I would love to read this poem because I am crazy for the epigraph. Uh, this is, uh, the poem is called Shipwreck, and the epigraph is by Fernando Pessoa, uh, the great Portuguese poet. And he said, I was shipwrecked, well he wrote, I was shipwrecked beneath a stormless sky in a sea shallow enough to stand up in. And we all know it can happen. They are laughable when we get there, the ultimate articulations of despair, trapped in a tub filling with our own tears, strapped to a breadstick mast a mouse could chew down, hopping around the house in paper shackles, wrist and ankle. It's always stagey. Being lost is just one's fancy, some cloth, some paste, the essence of flimsy. Therefore, we double don't know why we don't take off the Crusoe rags, step off the island, bow from the waist, accept your kudos. I think you should have the opportunity to hear a, at least a couple of poems that haven't yet made it into books. This is called Dogleg, and I just love the word dogleg. Some people don't know what it, it's usually applied to mean something that takes off at an angle. You know, you get something going this way and a road dog legs off. But of course it takes its name from the, the, the shape of a dog's leg. But I don't want to tell you anymore, I'll ruin my poem. Dog leg. Bird's legs do, of course, all dog leg, giving them that bounce. But these are not normal odds around the house. Only two of the dog's legs, dog leg, and two of the cat's. 50-50, that's as bad as it gets usually, despite the fear you feel when life has angled brutally. <laughs> that, I think that poem's kind of a dirty trick because it dog legs. You think it's funny, you know, you're going along and then you realize you've just been slugged. You know. Th this is called train track figure and I, since you don't have a chance to see it yourself, I'll explain a little bit. So let's say you're standing on, you're standing here, a train, a train track's here and a train's going by and there's something over here. That's all you need to know. Train track figure. Imagine a train track figure made of sliver over sliver of between car vision, each slice too brief to add detail or deepen. That could be a hat 
if it's a person, if it's a person, if it's a person. Just the same scant information timed to supplant the same scant information. I'll, this is my last poem, and I'll end on a slightly upper beat. This is called Odd Blocks. I just like to say that, Odd Blocks. Every Swiss village calendar instructs as to how stone gathers the landscape around it, how glacier-scattered thousand-ton monuments to randomness become fixed points in finding home. Order is always starting over. And why not also in the self? The odd blocks, all lost and left, become first facts toward which later a little town looks back. Thank you. Move this thing, so we move that out of the way. At the end, I thought, with your permission, I'd like to hear the read. We can't get too close together. Yeah. Um. Want me to? I will. I will. We have no secrets from these people. Okay, uh, are we properly these mic'd? Are our friends. Okay, good. Um, this is the second half of our presentation of the new uh, poet laureate, Kay Ryan. And I thought we would, we, Kay and I would just do his talk for a while, mostly her. Uh, Kay, I'm going to start off with us with just a personal question. Uh, you are from working people. Uh, I don't think the poet, the librarian of Congress can see. Jim, can, can you see through this? Can you back that up? Can, yeah, let's back it up there. Okay, good. I mean, I mean we, we, we can't let the patron of the entire Washington National Book Festival you know, uh, not see. Anyway, Kay, uh, you come from the West. You come from working people. You were raised largely in the Mojave Desert. Uh, you've got, a, a, I think, a rather unusual background for a poet. Can you just talk about your childhood? Well, it wasn't a particularly literary childhood. Uh, my mother was an elementary school teacher for a few years. Can you, uh, they can't hear you, I don't think. Can, can you, you can't hear, hear okay? Me? Is it working? Here, I'll try harder. D can you hear me now? Good enough? Okay. Uh, it was not, it, it was not a, a literary childhood for sure. Uh, my father was an a oil well driller. Uh, my mother was an elementary school teacher until she married. She was from Nevada. It only took two years to become a teacher in Nevada at that time. Her mother had also been a teacher. She, all you had to do was graduate from high school at that time. My grandmother was a, a, a teacher in the mining camps of Nevada. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, but in my childhood, I think I was most influenced by old classic comic books. My brother and I were avid comic book readers. Uh, and, uh, but I mean, I wasn't, I like to say that I was influenced by classic comic books, but that's just to try to make a good impression. I, I, was, I was, you know, very fond of Mickey Mouse and, and all of the Walt Disney characters. So it was a, and I, I enjoyed reading anything. I, 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 I found myself easily seduced by words. Uh, I remember a child in like third grade said to me, I was sort of a blabbermouth, and she said to me, she said, you don't have to broadcast it. And I, I was just devastated with the beauty of that expression. So I was always very vulnerable to the gorgeous word and the, uh, 
the power of language. What? You want to hear a good story? Yeah. Okay. Well, when I was in it's sixth, good. It, it's really good. Okay. When I was in sixth grade, I, 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 my family was not one that traveled or knew strangers. We didn't go on trips with. I, I, we stayed home and we ate in the kitchen and we didn't have many friends. But I found myself in a, in, in a, a alone with strangers in a s town that I didn't know. I didn't know any of these people. And I was in sixth grade and I, and I was eating dinner with them. And I, by what I said, I caused an adult woman stranger to spit her milk across the table. <laughs> I did that with language, and I realized at that time what a potent, potent thing. It was funny, you know, uh, I admit that. Uh, uh, but I realized how extremely potent language was. What a force. So I don't know if I answered your question, but. No, I mean, it, was, uh, it was only with great difficulty I controlled myself from spitting in my coffee. <laughs> uh, what first got you interested in poetry? Was it in school, in the family? Or where? You know, I think that I came reluctantly to poetry. I, I mean, I think I was just a really average kind of, uh, I, was a good, I was always a good student in high school and, and poetry is part of the program and I liked it just like I liked everybody, everything else and I wrote a haiku and I did this and that, but I, I wasn't particularly called at that time. But uh, uh, as time passed and I, I, beca I became a freshman in college at the community college, on the Mojave Desert where I matriculated, uh, I was introduced backwards to Emily Dickinson, my favorite way. Our teacher was telling us, Miss Foley was telling us about the, the, uh, what, who we would be studying this semester. And, and she's going through the, the syllabus and she says, she comes to Emily Dickinson, she says, I just don't know if I'm going to introduce you to Emily Dickinson or not. She means so much to be, me and the students last semester just savaged her. And so I thought, oh, I've got to read her, you know. Uh, so it was the best possible way to have her, have her uh, uh, taken away from me, to make, th make me go get her. And so I became an, a, an early and passionate Emily Dickinson uh, fan. Good. And uh, you've told me this before, and I, and I know you've mentioned it before, but there was actually, in your case, a decisive moment when you decided that you would make your life's work poetry. Would you tell the story? Unfortunately, this is one of those conversion stories, uh, a calling story. It smacks of religion, uh, something that should have happened to a nun or a saint, but it just happened to me instead. Uh, I was, I was w wanting, I, w I was feeling like I couldn't help being a poet, and yet I didn't want to be one because I was raised to be a practical person. and. Uh, and it was putting on airs to be a poet, just terribly. And also the quantity of self-exposure involved was hideous to me. So I was trying to resist the fact that it seemed as though my brain was rhyming all on its own and kind of creating work. And it wasn't of that nice superficial quality that I'd enjoyed earlier in life, uh, that were funny little, funny little poems. Uh, and so I took this bicycle trip across the United States. I thought that would give me enough time to solve this matter of, do I want to write? Should I be a writer? You know, California, it was all, it was all the way from Oregon to Virginia. California, nothing. Oregon, nothing. Montana, nothing. Wyoming, nothing. It wasn't a direct route, as you can see. Um, uh, Colorado, got into the Rockies in Colorado. Going up Hoosier Pass, very high pass in the Rockies. And suddenly, my mind simply clarified. Uh, it is one of those sort of mystical uh, conditions where the edges of your body disappear and the edges of everything disappear and one is sort of, uh, one's atoms are sort of communing with all the other atoms. Uh, I felt that if I could have swept my arm through a, a, a pine tree if I'd wanted to. Uh, and I realized I had a terrific power of power of mind that I'd never enjoyed before. And I, I, I tried a few little stunts with it, like little kite stunts. And then I realized, this is the perfect time to ask, shall I, shall I be a writer? And I, I did ask, whatever it was. Uh, I didn't know who I was asking. But the, the answer came back that was utterly disarming in its uh, simplicity and irresistibility. It was simply the question, do you like it? 
and I, there, there was no, there, I could answer easily. I did like it. I mean, I wasn't, it wasn't, yes, you should be a writer because you're going to eventually get to be the poet laureate, or you, should, you shouldn't be a writer because you really don't have the talent for it, or anything like that. It was just the question, and it was a clear question. I knew I liked it. I knew it was the only thing that consistently engaged and continued to engage my mind, and that was for me bottomless, that it had no ending. And, uh, and it has continued to have no ending. And I, I went from that day forth not knowing how to do it, but knowing that I, that I, had, that I actually was my, my calling. Yeah. You know, poet laureates uh, have tended to be people that went to Harvard and Princeton and Yale and Stanford, and then they did graduate degrees at Iowa. And then they've spent their, their careers teaching graduate creative writing classes at the Ivy League or this, the Seven Sisters. You've been very negligent have, in this yeah. regard. Yeah. Uh, you had the audacity to begin uh, at a community college. And just you, stay there. You have refused uh, to make a career teaching creative writing. And for reasons mysterious, you have made a career helping people attain literacy at a community college. Uh, how dare you? Uh, yes. <laughs> All the community college teachers in the world. Hello. Uh, and and uh, you have been, um, you know, the one term is outsider, a rather flashier term is an American maverick. Uh, uh, oh, no, no, uh, please. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, but what, in a sense, having, uh, you know, now, to, to quote Disraeli, climbed to the top of the greasy pole in American poetry, as, as someone who's done it entirely differently, has been an outsider, what, what do you think that that's, how do you think that's helped you, or how do you think it's hindered you in terms of your, both as your creative career and your personal life? Wow, aren't you glad that you asked that and don't have to answer it? Uh, uh, I think that I really had no choice. I had, I had very little ambition in the world. I, I, never, wanted, I never wanted to be a professor. I, I, I'm, I don't like to be an expert. I don't want to be responsible for knowledge. I almost got a PhD and it just terrified me. I, I realized that people would expect me to know something, you know, and I just, as soon as I figured that out, I just got out of there. Uh, uh, I, there wasn't really anything in the world that I wanted, except I really did like to write poems, and I wanted to write, uh, really, I wanted to write the best poems that I could ever possibly write, and I, I cannot learn from others. Um, it's, I'm, I'm not proud of that, but it's, it's just true. I don't, I don't learn very well from others, and I can barely learn from myself. So it's be been a very slow and anguished process, punctuated by a lot of amusement. Uh, but uh, I think, uh, it, in a way, it's almost a dirty trick to be an outsider, because, because it, it's almost like cheating. There is a certain romance attached in our, in our culture to the outsider. So, so in a way, even though it seems like a disadvantage, it can then, you can have this end run and have it become this giant advantage, you know? You can think, damn, why didn't I think of being an outsider? Why did I work <laughs> hard in, the, in this damn state college for 35 years, you know? Networking. Why did I network? I should have known better. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I want to ask another, you know, sort of hard question, and it's a sort of a Philistine question. I uh, like Philistines. You know, uh, the when I read your poems, you always say one thing when you're talking about something else. Your poems are, are always about two things at once. Why don't you just say what you mean? And this guy is the head of the NEA. <laughs> well, he's leaving in January, so it's okay. Uh, you know, saying what you mean is uh, the most interesting uh, endeavor, uh, in the sense that what you mean, or what, what I mean, doesn't have any words to it yet when I get it. I find that I'm most interested 
in some tiny little speck of something that hasn't been identified yet, or that seems to run opposite of, uh, what shall we say, uh, uh, common, common assumptions. Um, and what I have to do is, is I have this thing that, that, is, that is both shapeless and only, only, only a tiny bit known by me, just kind of, I, all I know is I'm excited, you know? And so what I have to find is some, some creature or some object that will embody it. Uh, so, so the thing is, is an entirely fabricated thing. I've almost never, despite the kind words of Dr. Billington, I almost never really do any good for the, the actual physical world. You know, I don't, I'm not talking about the real trees or the real grass or the mud or, or, or the mountains or, or the pur Purple Mountains Majesty or any of that. Every, I'm a total opportunist. I'm just taking things and using them to try to create some kind of model, maybe as a scientist would, uh, for something in my brain. And, and I don't know why that seems opposite to what its exterior is. I'm not sure that I even understand the question. But I thought if I yeah. talked long enough, yeah. you know, oh, you would have forgotten the question. But uh, then it leads to something. When you write... Yeah, do, try it again. Do, do you find... Uh, uh, well, this, let's forget that. <laughs> this, is, this is just idle uh, chit-chat okay, uh, okay, of a okay, transcendental yeah, kind. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. And that, so when you write, when you're trying, in a sense, to realize an idea you have, do you have some image of the reader? Is there, are you writing for anyone besides yourself? No. No, I have no image whatsoever of the reader, except in this way. I want my, my poems to be available to the reader. I mean, when I, when I have finished a poem, I want to believe that, that it, it can be transmitted into the mind of the reader. I mean, so, so I, I make sure that it's coherent in a way. I, I, want, I, want, it, I want the language to be uh, uh, soluble in other minds. Uh, so in that way, I have a strong sense of, of the reader. And I also, I also feel that one, a, a reader deserves pleasure. A reader, a reader deserves to have surface pleasure from a poem, as well as perhaps uh, a deeper mental or emotional pleasure. Just surface fun. So I suppose I do, but I'm, I'm primarily my own reader, and I am essentially attempting to amuse myself yeah. in the dark hours of the morning. Was there ever a point, once you made the decision to be a poet, to make that your life's work, that you felt like giving up? Yes, I would say, well, you know, I didn't know how to give up. How can you give up if you don't have anything else to do, you know? Uh, <laughs> I had nothing to give up to. Uh, but yes, I had, I had a, a maybe 15 years of finding it almost impossible to get anything accepted uh, anywhere. And uh, so it became extremely discouraging to write because I had this mounting stack of, of legal, you know, yellow, yellow tablet uh, uh, paper, mounting on my desk and I it just got bigger and bigger and none of it ever went away and it seemed like a absurd enterprise let me ask you two more uh, questions and then we'll open it up to the audience the first one is that American writers are supposed to be epic we're supposed to create works as large as the continent uh, Moby Dick gravity's rainbow oh who says uh, well why why are your poems so short uh, well, you know, I don't really have any, any answer to that. Uh, I don't know why they're so short. They, it satisfies me to have them be short. I like short poems. I, I, uh, didn't, didn't Edgar Allan Poe said that, that a, 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 no poem should be longer than could be uh, retained in the mind at, 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 one, at one time? Uh, I don't know that he's right, but uh, I, I just like the very... Uh, the very small, but I mean, I, I, they're only small on the outside. They, 
it's a reverse uh, scientific principle by which uh, what appears little is actually big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and finally, uh, now you really only just been poet laureate for a few months now. No, I actually I don't start for a few days. I oh. start October first. I, I haven't seen a penny. I haven't seen one penny. <laughs> This, well, is, then, this then, is gratis. You guys are yeah. getting this well, for then, nothing. Then can I ask you this question for free? Uh, the yes, but I'm under no obligation to answer. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, having uh, you know been chosen as poet laureate, what are your reflections? What are your uh, about the about the role that you'd like to play and the the possibilities of the office? Well, I've already tried out my chair. Uh, that was nice. Uh, I visited my office. My, my rug is all rolled up, though, in, my, in the beautiful uh, poetry room, because the roof leaked, apparently. So, so there's a little, it's not quite beautiful. I can't invite you all over right now. Uh, but uh, I, I, I don't know what I see in terms of, of uh, a project. I, I feel like a person who has been rewarded, like, much like the, uh, the uh, uh, Matra Gupta. I've been rewarded for a life of privacy, living in my pajamas, you know, essentially, and staying home, troubling no one, doing nothing, having very little social conscience, and re having been rewarded for this by being, being, being thrown into the public eye and expected to do things that have social import, you know. I, somebody asked me about my outreach, you know, was I thinking in terms of outreach, and I said, I have spent my whole life thinking about inreach. No? So, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well. I would like to do good, wouldn't yeah. we all? Yeah. But I'm, I'm hoping I can just like say a sentence like, uh, "Let's fund all the branch libraries 100 percent and keep them open, and keep them open seven days a week, and have long hours." You know, let's fund our libraries and then say, "Okay, somebody take it, do that." You know, <laughs> and I'll do TV spots. You know, this is your poet laureate saying, "Branch libraries." <laughs> okay, uh, we have two microphones that are set up in either aisle. Uh, I would invite any one in the audience who has a question, uh, you know, for Kay Ryan to ask for one. I'd ask that you uh, that the questions actually be questions, uh, and rather than screeds. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no screeds. We we can screed up here. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but, we'll uh, screen. But the, the microphone's there because otherwise the audience will not be able to hear the, the questions. So, uh, please, why don't, you, why don't you start us off? Is the, is the microphone on? No. Okay, oh. so it should be done. Yeah, yeah, it's on now. Okay. When do you know, this might get back to Dana's question, when do you know what you're writing about? The question is, when does Kay Ryan know what she's writing about? When Ooh. Um, well, a lot of times when I start, I think I'm writing about one thing. Uh, and uh, it, it, it migrates much. Two things help it. And I consider these great gifts. Uh, uh, it's important that we not wind up writing what we meant to write about, or it would be dead in the water. I mean, we would already kind of know that. So, so what, what helps me is I get started, and then the rhyming properties of words, each word calls, it calls to its family. So I have this whole, you know, it's like a cloud of birds that all want to get into the picture, you know, and they're all, they're all trying to get in, so they're changing the story. So, so language itself, rhyme itself, has a way of taking me away from where I thought I wanted to go. And, and another thing is the marvelous power of metaphor. I mean, like you say something like uh, uh, the other shoe. I mean, you, you want to write about the other shoe. And then, and then you start thinking about the shoe or the elephant in the room or the, the, uh, the, the chickens coming home to roost. And you get something. And the story takes over. And the power of the story, the power of the, the metaphor gets its own head and takes you in some direction you could never have gotten to. So all, all one really has to do is start. Yeah. And, and the, the start is usually uh, buried eventually. It, it, yeah. And something else, some finer machinery helps us. That's why poetry can be better than we are. Uh, 
because we have the help of all these beautiful language systems that 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 carry us. I'm I'm asking because um, we're, we're we're very tight on time, oh, okay. and I want to get a couple more people in. So we have one of our poetry out loud champions there. Um, my question was really similar, actually. On on that note, do your poems ever surprise you with what they end up saying? They do. They scare me. I mean, sometimes they. Sometimes they surprise me in a happy way, and I mean a funny way, and sometimes they, they frighten me. I, I have discovered, and I, I wonder how many poets in this room would, would, ha would have the same feeling. When I've written something that I ultimately feel is a pretty good piece of work, I often feel that I've gone too far, and I'm, I'm, rather, I'm rather frightened of what I've done, or feel that it is excessive, it seems, it seems that I've gone too far. Uh, and I guess that has something to do with the, the power of language to take us farther than we knew how to go. And therefore, since you're, you're farther than you meant to be, you don't know where you are. And so it takes a while to sort of figure out if that was a good place or a bad place. Good. I think we have time for one more question. Sir, would you like to? Uh, when you make your connections I'm, I'm, uh, that you do, the, the flashes of insight or whatever, does it get any easier as you go along? Is there any periods where you get on a roll? Or? Uh, are there periods when you get on a roll? Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes I've, I've written a poem in, in just a, 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 you know, like an hour, even half an hour. And it's just remarkable. You can get on a roll like crazy. Or, or in a, uh, I usually write my poems in one sitting. Uh, but that would be a, a course of, say, three or four hours, a very, very intense labor. Uh, I might write 16, 20 drafts during, during the course of that time. And I have little roles, you know, like a role that takes me uh, another, another line or two on, and then I'm stuck again. And, and so it's a, it's a matter of being on tiny roles that eventually turn into a, a sandwich. Good. Well, I, uh, I'm, we're out of time, but I've, I've asked uh, you know, Kay if she would read one more poem. I've taken the liberty of choosing one of my particular favorites. It's a poem which uh, has a title that's a neologism. Uh, it rhymes with grandeur, but it's blandeur. Yes, yes. This is uh, indicative of my constantly asking the universe for less. Blandeur. If it please God, let less happen. Even out Earth's rondeur. Flatten Iger. Blanded the Grand Canyon. Make valleys slightly higher. Widen fissures to arable land. Remand your terrible glaciers and silence their calving. Having or doubling all geographical features toward the mean. Unlean against our hearts. Withdraw your grandeur from these parts. OK, Ryan, thank you so very much. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dr. Billington. Thank you, Book Festival. Attendees. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.